Oh, that's hard. One thing? I don't know. They do pretty amazing work. And, you know, you have to read one story or have one person come up to you and, you know, hear about how these dogs change people's lives. And you're, it's pretty amazing. And the Lions Foundation is really good at it. They're the biggest organization in the country that does it. And I'm proud. It's, I'm proud to be part of it. So this is Ambrose. Um, Ambrose was born in middle of October, so right now he's about three and a half months old. Um, and he's currently our third foster. He is being fostered mainly by my sister. So she takes care of him, so this is her guy. Um, but he was one of six puppies in his litter, and they are purebred uh, labs. Um, I'm a foster. We are a foster family. So I'm a foster parent, so purely just take in fosters. So Odessa is with us, lives with us for anywhere between 10 months and a year, and we train her on the basics. So sit, come, heal, stay, and we socialize her. So we bring her everywhere we go. We are issued a dog at about six and a half weeks old, um, and we, uh, it becomes part of our family until it's about a year old. After that, they go on to Oakville for further training with the professional trainers. We call it Doggy University. Um, they provide six services. So there's the uh, autism assistance service dog where they provide um, more of a social um, studying kind of interaction with a child with autism. Um, then there's the seizure response dog guides, the diabetic alert, um, canine vision, hearing ear and special skills so people in wheelchairs and low mobility. The most common breeds for the dog guides are Labradors and Standard Poodles. And then sometimes they get donations like there was a German Shepherd in there for a while and they just started crossing Labs and Golden Retrievers. Well there's a couple of reasons that I've heard on why they chose these particular breeds. For the poodles, um, it is for allergy reasons um, and for the non-shedding aspect of the dog. Uh, for the Labradors, they say that they're a good choice for a service dog because they have what they call rubber hearts. So they will bounce to whoever offers them food. So Labradors um, are a good choice for that. I also really wanted a dog and dogs get really expensive. <laughs> so the other app, like bonus is that dog guides are, are the vet bills and food is covered. So that was a big selling point for my parents. From birth until they are placed with a client, it takes about $25,000. But I get to buy treats. <laughs> <laughs> so not $25,000 worth of treats, thank goodness. No money comes from the government for these dogs. It all comes from private donations and a lot from corporations as well. Um, and the Lions Foundation or Lions Clubs across Canada also donate a fair amount. So to separate work and play, uh, the fosters are wearing foster dog guide jackets. And when we put on those jackets, it's supposed to imitate that they're a working dog. Um, I think most of it is just done by experience. The dog itself understands after a period of time when the jacket goes on, uh, playtime ends. When the jacket is off, they're allowed to be a dog. They can run, they can jump uh, to an extent. Um, they can play. Um, when the jacket goes on, they become very serious. Their jacket is the biggest reason and she knows when she puts her jacket on that she's working and that she can't play and that she never gets like a free walk. They're allowed free walks every once in a while and her jacket's never on for that kind of thing. I think she also knows because she knows, like for us, our dog is left behind a lot and we and she gets to go everywhere and I'm sure they get it. Maybe I'm giving her too much credit, but I'm sure they get it that she's privileged. She doesn't love putting her jacket on, to be honest with you, and I always say, you're lucky, like you're a special dog because you get to put this jacket on and go everywhere with me. They do definitely behave differently when the jacket is on and I think they just start to realize the difference between the two. We don't let them have sort of free play and run around when they're wearing the jacket. Um, when they're running around the backyard off leash, it would always be jacket off. The most challenging part of training, um, probably some of the tasks that are required by the dogs. Um, because they go into public and because they have to be able to perform in different places, uh, there are tasks that a normal dog wouldn't be required to do, uh, just a pet. Um, they have to do escalators. Um, which is extremely hard for a dog. It's not something a normal dog would do. It's not something a human would do either if they didn't 
uh, have to, I don't think. And training with escalators takes the most amount of time. I wanted to bring our dog, our pet dog, everywhere before, well, I still do, but we can't, because that's not the way the world works. And I do think it demeans the hard work of organizations like the Lions Foundation, people, legit organizations that are trying to do good. I haven't had a problem with a store owner not allowing us in. Um, and a lot of store owners have been very okay, even if the dog happens to have an accident because they get very anxious in stores for their first time. Um, but just if they're more welcoming, restaurants, etc., then it makes um, the life easier down the line for the people who have real service dogs. He's in training with the Lions Foundation to be a service dog. Yes. Yes. I did have one kind of yucky situation at Costco when I had both the kids with me and someone berated me and told me it was the meanest thing I could ever do to my children. And that, but, and I disagreed and I didn't actually ask his opinion, which, you know, it's not surprising, but I disagreed because I was like, this is our way of teaching the kids that they can give back and that we're fortunate and we have a roof over our head and food and all and we're able to do all everything because we're healthy right this is our way and he thought it was the cruelest thing he's like how are they going to behave when you give back it's going to be hard we're not she's the first one and i've always I, everyone tells us the first one's the hardest one there's no doubt it's going to be hard when we give her back but we'll have another one and we have a pet at home we'll hopefully get another foster soon after that and I think it'll be good. And when they go to graduation, the kids, I, it's going to hit home, right? Biggest thing is uh, for the public to make our job easier would be to ask us before they interact with the dog. We're more than happy to answer questions about the dogs and about the training. But if we've asked that the dog not be disturbed or if we're in the midst of trying to train them on the escalator, we would prefer not to be interrupted. So always ask before you start to interact with the dog. And even though we've said that we don't want you to interact or don't um, want you to talk to the dog, people still will say, oh, what a cute little puppy. I know I'm not supposed to talk to you. Well, that distracts the dog. So biggest thing is don't distract the dog if, unless we give you permission. Well, I think keep asking questions. I think it's great that people are interested in knowing why she's got this great jacket on, what she's going to do, and you know, and the questions are a lot. I also would really appreciate it if people asked before they interacted with her or pet her. I think just general education, knowing that the dogs are working and that they should be left alone. Um, usually we try to educate people if they're paying too much attention to the dog, to ask them to generally just ignore the dog would be best ask questions and become educated on what the service dogs are and what their purpose is um, so that everyone can you know enjoy being out with their dogs and not be discriminated or hassled. The volunteer whether you've got time to walk dogs um, or just take a foster in it's a year out of your time but um, it's a great great thing to do. Because most of the money um, or all the money comes into dog guides from donations um, I'd love to see people donating more money. I've always wanted to do it. I'm, we are very much a dog family and everyone in the family is a bit animal crazy so I always thought we were kind of perfect candidates to do it and I always wanted to give back. We decided to help out with dog guides um, after our pet dog Savannah had passed away. It's something that we'd always been interested in. It was my dad who started um, fostering and it was because my two younger sisters were actually still living with him and they wanted a dog and my dad did not want to commit to another lifetime of having a dog like we did when we were kids um, so we ended up fostering our first one with Lions Foundation and then just continued on. And so our first dog, Rena, is a canine vision dog and she's gone off to work with a client in Prince Edward Island and to get a call from that client and be told how well the dog is doing with them really makes it very rewarding. We can change someone's life. It's pretty powerful, right? It's a pretty, and it's a big message that I want to send to my kids, right? That we are lucky and we are fortunate people and this is our way of and we have a lot of people who come up to us. Happened to us the other day, we were in Indigo and a man was deaf. He's now since had an implant, which I didn't even know could happen, but he has had a dog for eight years. And he went up to me and he said, I don't know how you do what you do, but I appreciate it every day. I'm like, wow, 
He's a complete stranger, and I'm changing his life.